Architecture Award em 2006 e 2008, Fellowship no JST de Harvard e um Riba, Riba International Fellowship. O seu trabalho foi amplamente publicado e exibido no MoMA, em New York, no VA Museum em Londres e na Bienal de Mesa, entre outros lugares. Em 2013, juntamente com Andreas Lepic e Hubert Klumpner, deu início ao Laufen Manifesto, onde profissionais e académicos de todo o mundo contribuíram para definir diretrizes para uma cultura de design humanista. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, in, in the name of the Architects Association uh, and the, all the Portuguese architecture, uh, it's an honor to have you here with us. Um, I'm happy to ask you to present your lecture, Architecture is a Tool to Improve Lives, and thank you so much. Muito obrigada. Boa tarde a todos. Boa tarde. So, I'll share my screen. Yes, architecture is a tool to improve life that I really firmly believe in. Unfortunately, also the opposite is true. Architecture can destroy, but I am an idealist. I really believe that we can do better as we do now. We can build, um, we can build up good buildings. At, at the same time, we can build up communities and we can do this in harmony with nature. So the slides are not working yet now. <laughs> so this picture is um, a study trip I did with students from ETH Zurich with Martin Rauch. And it's in the end of October in the mountains in Austria. It's really cold. So it's about this time of the year. And in the evening or in the afternoon, we surprised the, new, the group with the news that there was no hut or any sort of accommodation booked for the night. And the challenge was to build your own shelter with whatever you could find. And the results were not really luxurious. <laughs> they were actually really, it was cold. It was super cold, but it was a great learning experience for all of us that there are a lot of resources given by nature for free. And all we need is the sensitivity to see those resources and the creativity to use them. And that's what I, I found myself in a similar situation When I was 19 years old, I went to a remote Bangladeshi village called Rutupur. Actually, I was there just a few days back, so I'm <laughs> feeling already homesick. And I was a development learner, and I had the great chance to learn from a Bangladeshi NGO called Deepshika that the most effective strategy for resilience and for sustainable development is always to see, to look what resources you have available, immediately available, what is given by nature and how you can do the make the best out of it by just using your own talents and the group and that is what i tried to transmit into architecture or translate into architecture several years later i designed a school in that village um, in Rotopur called the metis school and this is how the site looked like in terms of energy sources it was the cows it was people and the bamboo that was growing all around and of course the earth, the mud that was just below under the feet. And after six months of construction, the school looked like this, really low bearing earth walls with no cement added and then a kind of light um, rhythmic bamboo story. And for the realization, I had a partner, Eike Roswag, Because, you know, coming straight from university, I didn't really know how to build. <laughs> I had to learn it on that site. So the school, the classrooms are very neutral. And it, we also kept the tradition to sit on the ground on the lower class at the, at the younger kids age. And through this bolt hole in the, in the back wall, you come into the caves area. And I was just trying to remember, you know, what are the spaces I loved when I was a kid? Because the briefing of the client was to design a school where, where, where the children really feel well, where they want to go in and not think every morning, oh my God, I have to go to school yet another day, but that they really actually love to enter and to go. So I tried to really to make it, you know, in a way that it's really playful and joyful 
And I think, you know, in the end, we all have this kind of a feeling towards this archaic patterns, like the, ca the, the, the caves, the warmth, you know, feeling utterly protected, but still having some sort of overview on the things that are going on. And the opposite of it, of course, is a tree house. So that's how I designed the top floor. The children all signed with the names on the doors and they rightfully did so because they also had building a school. And you cannot do this with every material, you know, you can't do this with concrete that, and, or anything, you know, material that is harmful or that needs sophisticated tools that could harm you. But with the clay, I think you all remember how good it feels to have your hands in the clay and the children really loved it. So they did real work, of course, easy work, but real work. And that also is a really good feeling to, to feel, you know, that, that you are needed, that you're part of something big and you're not just amused at the side as we do it a lot with children, you know, we, we put, put them to play and, and games and they play with plastic buggers and sites and kitchen while they could just actually be involved in real life. And I guess you can imagine how the children felt after six months of construction. If you think, you know, you're a small girl standing in front of the school, knowing that you built this school, but just using your hands, your muscles and the dirt beneath your feet, that just gives such an enormous boost of, of confidence, of trust in your own feeling and uh, your own talents in the, in the group, you know, the strength and the power in the group, the team, the village, and of course, in the local materials. And that's very important because earth and bamboo have a very bad image. They're supposed to be not durable. In fact, they stand for a very long time. You need certain to consider certain rules. And the first rule is a good foundation. So that the water cannot penetrate from, from the ground and a good roof so that the water cannot penetrate from the top. I think you also have a lot of earthen structures in, in, in Portugal and you know that they last a long time if, if you know there's a roof on top. And then of course, it's also a question of the mix. You have to have some sort of other materials in it like stones or straw so that the, the walls getting rough and, and, and limit the speed of the water running over the facade. And that's all that is needed to prevent the walls um, you know, from, from eroding. And these walls are standing since 2005 and the rainy season is hitting every year in a horizontal harsh way the walls and they are standing strong. So, and why for me in terms of sustainability, earth is the champion. It's the only material you can take from the ground. You can recycle as often as you want without any loss of, of quality. So it's no downcycling. Any other material you downcycle, but earth always keeps the same quality. You just have to add water, that's all. And you can return it back to the ground it came from without leaving any scars and you can plant your garden on top. And that's really for me a wonderful quality. And in terms of economic sustainability, it was wonderful to observe how the building budget was spent because every day, you know, the workers got in the evening, they got the, the daily wage, the daily salary. And then with that money, they went to the local market and I could see how they spent the money. So they would buy the vegetables from the neighbors or from the farmers or get a new a new haircut at the local barber shop or the bicycle repaired or a new sari blouse. So the money, the building budget was immediately reinvested in the community. And if I had built that school in concrete and steel, this money would have been lost for the people. It would have been exported and there would have been no, no local development happening. So for me, it's really the, the wonderful thing was that the building budget did not have just a, a school as a result, but it was also a catalyst for local development. That made me most happy. So for me, when it comes to the question of social uh, of, of economic sustainability, the question is always who gets the profit. You know, it's not about low cost. It's getting who. It's the question who is getting pro the profit. And in the end of my career, when I'm adding up, when I'm summing up all the building budgets that went through my hands, I want to be able to tell myself that I supported people, that I supported craftspeople with that. 
and not just, you know, big industries. So my strategy that I'm using in all the project is local materials plus local energy sources. And for me, local energy is craftsmanship. When we think of, of energy sources, we think of wind, we think of so, sun and so on. But we as human beings, we are also a source of energy and we are growing source. We are having almost 8 billion people. So if, we don't, if this source is not used, we also create a social problem. And architecture can involve a lot of people. We need to create work. That's also one of our responsibility. So local energy for me is means really craftsmanship, means people. Of course, the sun too, but also first people. And then on top of it, global knowledge. I think the knowledge should not be limited to a place. It should be accessible anywhere, every time, anytime. So, but then this kind of information should be applied onto the local conditions so that it makes sense. So I'm using this not just in architecture, but meanwhile, also for the textiles. I'm doing textile works, but I'm not doing it as a, as a fashion designer, but as an architect, because, you know, observing Bangladesh for so many years, so since 1997, I'm, I'm there every year, except last year. And you see that the settlement pattern is, is strongly influenced by the government sector, by the way we shop our clothes. So that's kind of the crazy thing. You know, we think, you know, urban planners and architects are shaping spaces, but we do it constantly through the way we shop. And in Bangladesh, definitely it's the government sector that has the biggest imprint on the settlement patterns. So this is what we are causing with, you know, the fast fashion that we are consuming a lot. And this is how the people, the workers come from. This is the environment they, they come from. So it's the women, as a woman in Bangladesh, you hardly have a chance to, to get any job or to have any skill training. So you, if you're lucky, you become a teacher, but most of the time you are a factory worker, tailor, or you, you know, you're working on, on the agricultural field as a day laborer. So a lot of women have to leave their families, have to leave their their, their homes and you know in the in the villages they can build their own homes with whatever they can find you know with the straw with the mud with the bamboo but when they move to the cities they need accommodation they have to rent accommodation so they have really quite a part of the income goes for this kind of rent then the children it's a big issue you know what do you do if you have children do you lock them in a room somewhere or, you know, in, in the village, they just have the most fantastic <coughs> playground. They run around, they have almost no cars there. So it's, and the air is healthy. So this is really the most happy situation a child can have that you lose this situation you lose when you go and work in the factories. And of course, also, you know, the care for the elderly people that just comes automatically. That's kind of as well. You can have your cattle, you can have your animals, your goats, your cows and a little home garden, you know, to, to, to add to your, to, to, to your food for the family. What's missing is that the, the pressure of land, you know, the land scarcity is a huge problem. Before they had more land and now because of the overpopulation, they have less and less land available for, for food cultivation. So they need to have a second income source. And that's, you know, that's not available in the rural areas. And this is why I started Dipti Textiles, you know, a textile, um, small textile production hub where the women can stay in the village. And we also work with the, with the resources that we found available in, in the village. And this is one of those. So as a woman um, that, or that they often, you know, come together and, and start stitching this kind of sari blankets out of old used sardis already and then they sleep on top of these blankets and then this kind of beautiful structures unfold and we then they're coming to our small um, workshop textile workshop in the village and then they are turned into fashion for Europeans so it's kind of the other way around normally we produce very cheap clothes in Bangladesh then get it in Europe wear it four or five times send it back to you know maybe some African um, market in Ghana, for example, where it also destroys the income sources for local tailors. 
And uh, we wanted to turn the whole circle upside down, produce, you know, send the old clothes from Bangladesh with a high price <laughs> to, to sell it in, in Europe. Also as a kind of a message that a good life quality doesn't mean graving for new resources all the time, but we can add another layer of, of craftsmanship, another layer of creativity and use existing resources to create something that is unique. We also started documenting our own projects in on, on top of these blankets. So this is obviously the Metis school, and this is a documentation of the village of Dodupu itself. And what you see here, the blue dots, these are the ponds um, where the mud is excavated. So this is the source for the building material for all these houses, all these small ponds. They are then used for fishing afterwards for, to, to you know, cultivate fish. Then this green dot is all the bamboo that is also growing. This is kind of almende where you know people are using this bamboo also for the houses. And then the paddy fields, the agriculture all around for the food that the families need. So in total, it's a very, it's a very um, sustainable life. It's a very small material circus and flows. And there is a lot of things to learn from, and it's really a huge inspiration for me. So, but we started working with the woman and we thought, you know, they can take the, the clothes back home and do it besides the children, can do it whenever they want. They can kind of check the time, be completely decentralized. But then we found that the women so much enjoy to come together to discuss about the problems and the issues, joys and sorrows. So we needed a space for them. And then we started designing. At the same time, though, um, we got approached from a foundation who wanted to, to start uh, together with Dipshika uh, Center for People with Disabilities. And that kind of two issues got combined. And unlike the first building that were, were very straight and box-like, um, the Meti School, also the second building, the Deshi building, this one is kind of breaking out of the mold. And it's also a sign, you know, that it's be something beautiful that we as human beings, not just following all the same pattern, but that we have people that break out of that mold. And that this diversity is something unique, absolutely unique and absolutely to celebrate and absolutely beautiful. So this is kind of the message of this building. And when you approach it, you see a ramp that is winding up all around that building and of course already during the site people were coming and asking why is there a ramp it's the only ramp in that area and then it's so dominant and it's kind of so large and then you're immediately at the discussion on inclusiveness why it is impossible why it is um, so necessary that we have universal access that you know there are no barriers and everyone can access and that's also the power of architecture. It can make it can it can shed lights to things and people that are usually in communities that are usually overlooked, and also can can bring things to the surface and create awareness. That's the therapy room and the ground floor, and the caves underneath the ramp. And they're specially designed. They're designed in a way that you really have to force your body a bit through it. So you have to make an effort. And it, this is also, these movements are also part of the therapy. And it's clearly only for the kids. It's not for the therapist, you know, <laughs> usually doesn't go inside. But the kids, they're whoop, you know, when it's therapy is too much or whatever, they just can escape and play, play around there and, re and regain the energy. I, I just was there and it's so funny to see how the children are using this place and, and, and it's also so wonderful because um, people with disabilities they were very much hiding away before and now they have a place to come that is specially made for them and that has a beauty and and that is just so much giving them so much dignity also and it's really the feedback that I also got from the parents they were really 
they were really very happy to have this place. And I know it also from a friend here in, 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 in Lauf, in, in my hometown, who is a child with disabilities. And she said, you're always trapped somehow in an ugly world because all these devices are ugly, you know, that, and, and, and you always have to use the kind of the back entrance and, and it's always, you're kind of always excluded from the good things. And that's why it was really important to give them the, a super, trying to make the best place for them and the most beautiful place that I could imagine somehow. So this is the ramp. It's all in modern bamboo and then also the, the terrace on top. And this is the workspace of the women of Dipti Textiles. Here you see actually the blanket that is now behind me. And then of course the question is how do you trans, transfer or, or bring this kind of approach to the European context? And this is the first project that I was commissioned in Europe together with Martin Rauch in Austria. It's, it's in, a, in a big company called Omicron. It's in an atrium. It's, it's a place that is covered. And Omicron is sponsoring a lot of projects in the developing world. And they wanted to bring back a bit of this atmosphere into the headquarter. So um, we wanted to test you know, how to bring the most simplest and easiest way of building, meaning taking the wet soil from the local ground and just shaping it by hand, you know, with, with nothing else but, but your hand. But we wanted this, this method is used a lot throughout the continents and throughout the world. And we wanted to do it in a two-story way because we always, you know, Martin is always looking for some challenge and this is what we did. And the question was, yeah, now it should be already 8 billion, you know, the, this is kind of an equation I always have in my mind when I'm designing. The world is not changing with one big decision. The world is changing with the everyday small decisions that we're taking. And, you know, it might be just one wall that is using too much cement, too much steel, or one wall that is covered with, you know, a paint that is not healthy, or just a little bit of glue or a little bit of foam here and the, 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 the insulation, you know, that no one sees, we just make it oil by based with XPS and so on. You know, it might be a small quantity for one project, but if we multiply it by 7 billion or by 8 billion by every person, if every person was doing the same decision, then the world would look dramatically different. So I'm always trying to design a way Bangladesh could also afford it and in a way that I can tell myself I'm not harming the planet and I'm not creating social injustice because this is, this is you know, it, if we all use this just one liter of bad paint, then our groundwater would be in disaster and this little bit of glue and this little bit of insulation material. So we really try, I'm always trying to multiply it, these decisions in my head and, and trying to question myself, how would the world look like? How would the resources be exploited? Would there be more justice or less justice? And these are the questions that I'm having in mind. So this is the, the design for, for this atrium. It's kind of the hangout area for the employees. So you have a, a monolithic structure out of earth and then a timber structure that is hanging from the top because this was existing already, the, the steel beam and we attached an, a zeppelin there out of wood. And this is kind of the space in the ground floor of the monolith, of the earth monolith. And it's a very archaic um, atmosphere again. It's filled with fair textiles also from Bangladesh. And it's, you know, where people can, can retreat. It's a very, communicate. it's a lot of communication in that company. They have a very communicative, um, culture there. There's also, you cannot even lock your office room, you know, it's all transparent all the time. So we wanted to create the absolutely opposite, a really archaic space where they can just, you know, focus on themselves again and really, you know, um, look within themselves and find, find their or root back somehow. And these are the power nap niches and the top floor and the monolith from the outside, and you also see in the backside the wooden zeppelin.
So this is how we built it, purely earth. And this is the Zeppelin out of timber. And then it's with an upholstery out of fair um, silk from a leprosy project in India. And this is how the kind of the, the um, flying kind of meeting place looks like from the inside. Another project, um, the hostels for the long run International Bamboo Biennale in the village Baozi in China. There the question was, you know, how can you really show that bamboo is a contemporary material? And for me, it's very important to say, you know, a material can be old, but still the architecture can be absolutely modern. It's not a matter how old the material is. It's a matter of our creative ability to use it today. So the design is in a way to have um, a solid core out of stone and out of rammed earth and attached to this core, there are these concons, a little bit like tents or Chinese lampshade and around is a very expressive open um, um, woven um, vessel like bamboo structure. And of course, I was wondering how can I insulate this expressive kind of shape and, and building. And then I started observing the people and I thought first I thought it's a kind of a strange fashion that they're having. It looks like these blankets that, you know, my grandmother was using and but just tailored around the body until I figured out, hey, that's actually the insulation. You know, they are living in cold rooms. They wear the insulation around the bodies and then they heat themselves up with, you know, hot soup or hot tea and kind of having this heat source then um, that they're consuming all the time. And I thought you know, that's maybe also something to try out. You know, you have a cold building just in the ground floor in the lobby, you have a good oven where you can warm up. This is also warming up the water for the showers. And then, you know, before you go to bed, there's a gong and you will get a nice, um, a nice hot water bag. You take this heat source on your body, you wrap the sleeping bag around it, and then you kind of have your heating source on your body, your insulation around your body. But the, the air you're breathing is, is really is, is cold and that's also quite healthy. And in summer, you just open the Kong Kong and let the breeze in. That was the idea. That did not completely work out because um, <laughs> That's what the Chinese that got lost in the Chinese um, German communication somehow. But what was not lost was really the super refined bamboo structures. And this is how you see how the, the core is made. And this is, this is the majority of the buildings in China. And between 2011 and 2013, China has consumed more cement than the United States in the past century. And that of course is not just China, it's happening all over the world. People are tearing down the natural, you know, the earth houses, the stone houses, the timber houses and built with concrete. And I've just been, to Bangladesh and I was shocked how much the village has changed within these two years. I really cried when I saw these people were tearing down their beautiful earth houses that were standing there for 50, 60 years. And now they are getting replaced by tin houses with, with um, concrete columns. And this is what the, uh, the, the government just hands out for free. <laughs> you know, if you get something for, for free, a house for free, you don't say no, although, you know, they figure out hmm, it's quite hot in summer to live in a tin house and quite cold in winter to live in a tin house. But still, you know, it looks shiny and it looks modern and it looks new. And and somehow this trend is is leading us to towards a real disaster. So we really have to, to look for alternatives and building with natural building materials such as earth such as timber such as fibers like straw such as stone is something really um, absolutely necessary for the future those natural building materials they don't have any carbon emissions embodied but they have human human labor they have craftsmanship embodied 
So building with natural building materials really is an effective act to counteract to our biggest challenges or to help mitigating two of our most difficult challenges, which is climate change and social injustice. Because those building with those materials create work and they don't add to, to the climate change because there is no CO2 embedded. Yeah, I'm also working now in Germany. This is the Campus St. Michael. It's a campus for sustainable, for all sorts of organization working towards social and environmental sustainability. And this is how I'm designing. I'm always designing on large clay models. So I call this the clay storming. It's a very intuitive approach where I'm just, you know, sketching 3D with my hands, with my fingers in the clay and because the clay can constantly shape the or change the shapes. It goes very fast. And at one point, I'm really trying, you know, to blend out my ego completely and just go, you know, connect with my gut feeling, with the intuition and see what's coming out. So these are the drawings for it. So the construction starts after the snow. So hopefully in February next year. And of course, in, 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 in Germany, I can't, you know, turn with the water bubble buffaloes to mix the mud. I need some different technology. And one of the technologies that is or very promising and very practical um, technology is prefabrication of, of earthen structures that are developed by my, my colleague Martin Rauch. So this is a construction site in Austria. It's the, it's the earth factory of, of Linton Erde, of Erdenberghalle. And here you see kind of a large machine that is ramming large earth walls. So it's using all the excavation materials from the region. It gets brought in here and then the machine is ramming this towards to into large um, wall blocks. And then on the site, they're kind of joined together. So this is another site together with Martin Rauch. It is here you see, you know, on you, you see it already retouched. So this is no Photoshop that you don't see the joints anymore. And here they're still wet and here they're not yet retouched. But if you just add water and then press the same material in, you can build it completely monolithic and you wouldn't see that this was cut into pieces before. So and this is kind of um, the, the end result, this is how the rooms look like. It's a health center for Ayurveda retreat in, in Rosenheim in Germany as well, designed with Martin Rauch, who just won the, the European Bauhaus Award for that. And that is also, the rooms are, are rather small. It's 14, 15, 16 square meters. And normally, you know, we think, you know, we want to have large rooms, we want to have luxurious rooms, and they stay there for about two weeks, the guests, and sometimes even three weeks. So it's not the size that matters, it's the quality of the materials. And all these materials are super natural, are really healthy, also because the earth can, can balance the indoor humidity perfectly. So it's, it's the best material. You know, when, when, when you heat the rooms, then they're getting extremely dry. You don't have this with the mud. And also, you know, it's not getting too much moisture. It's always balancing the, the, the humidity in a way that it really feels, you feel absolutely comfortable and it's, it's really healthy. So we also have the rent earth walls. We have more the refined mud plasterings and the floor is also earth stabilized with casein, which is kind of a milk product. And of course, timber we have also there. So it's kind of this, this, this combination of these natural materials. And also from the outside, you have a willow facade and the, the structure itself is low bearing timber structure. And the house is built in an alluvial forest with a lot of willow trees around. So we also used this material in a woven facade to cover you know, the, the most dominant part of the building. The building also is not straight, it kind of nestles in, in the surrounding and oof, sorry, this is, this is also important because it is a quite a sensitive spot. So when we go into kind of, I think it's very important that we also build good examples, how you can build smaller spaces and with a good quality that we say, you know, all this invention that we have now in terms of sustainability, they often get it's this kind of called rebound effect. We have, we know it with the cars, for example, you know, we, we have better 
of more efficient engines now, but at the same time, we are building much bigger cars and much faster cars. So everything, you know, that the engines are more effective is eaten up by the bigness and, and, and also the fastness. So I think, you know, we have to go more into quality rather than in size. And this is what we in, in Europe have to relearn, I think. Another project in, in, in Europe, in Austria, it was a birth room that was designed together with Anne Verdure, also Martin Rauch and Sabrina Sommer. And um, here you see already Anka, she is also a midwife, so she's already testing some birthing situations. The, the idea behind it was, you know, we have spaces for almost everything, but we don't have real good spaces for giving birth. And this is an act which is probably, you know, the greatest thing a human being can do, create another life. And, but it's an ultimate female topic, of course. <laughs> And there are no spaces for it. You know, we go have we have the chance to go into the hospital or we give birth, you know, in the in the midst of kitchen <laughs> and, and laptop and whatever, you know, children all around. So, but you need somehow you really a sensitive place for that as well. It's kind of a blind spot yet. It's not yet really covered by architects, probably also because architects in the past have been more male than female. <laughs> So we didn't find any sponsors for this project, but we found more than 400 women who wanted to build a prototype for this. And we also found lots of female volunteers who had building on the construction site. We built this um, belly, <laughs> this kind of highly due belly and, and structure out of adobe bricks, unfired clay bricks. And of course that would wash away in the Austrian climate. So we had to cover it with lots of shindles and we use them in a rather playful way. Shindles are traditional in that area. And here you see the final structure. The ground floor is simple. So it has kind of, it's a, it's a simple small structure. You have an elemented platform where you can test all different kind of, of we tested all different kind of birthing positions. And this is how it looks. So it's a very archaic space as well. It has this kind of warm feeling, this cave feeling, you feel protected. And you now if you imagine you, you're in your mother's warmth as a baby, and then you come out of this dark, cozy space, and then usually you come out in this super bright light in a hospital, that's probably a, a pretty stressful moment. And that affects life definitely and, and our biography, everyone's biography. So we wanted to create a much more central place and, and much more intimate space where also the mother can really open up her senses because in the end, birth, giving birth is all about opening up. And this is the birth space from, from the outside of the birth room. Um, this is now used for, it's attached to a women's museum, so this is more prototype, you know, for, for discussions and, and to create awareness. Ideally, this would be located, of course, very close to a hospital. But here we created it also as a workshop space, so we have this fire pit in front, we have the place where people can gather and discuss, and around it all is a garden with medical plants, especially for the female body. Yeah, and that um, was built also somehow during the pandemic, during the first lockdown that we had in, in, in Austria and Germany. And, you know, that makes you think, you know, what kind of, how, you know, it is also kind of a process of hibernating right now. And what will we give birth to a new awareness after, you know, this pandemic might be over or not, or after this crisis. And I was just thinking, you know, I'm hoping that, that the architecture also includes more female attitude. It's not just about women, you know, men can also have this, this female qualities, but, you know, this kind of exploring new territories, always getting faster, higher, bigger, this kind of exploitive conquering. This is something we cannot just continue because this is really killing our planet. And we have to go more into this caring and empathic empathetic 
and and sensitive and, and nurturing kind of architecture, which I think is kind of a female, um, our female qualities, which can be, of course, also used by men. Another project I'm currently working on is a master plan for, or is, is a campus for education in Ghana. It's for Don Bosco. And so for the Catholic Church, and we know that, you know, in, in, in this decades of colonialism, of missionary work, of development aid, we did a lot of mistakes. I mean, and <laughs> we transported kind of our rational and functional thinking to those kind of very vibrant and lively contexts and completely ignored the, the cultural richness that is on those at these places. So sadly, this is the, the master plan that we got from Ghana, but of course this is not, it has, it has very much the spirit of, of you know, the European AIDS and, and decades of, of what I just, said before, colonialism and so on. And this is what you see implemented all over the places. And not just in Ghana, also in other places. This is like people think like an institution has to look like, you know, you have a grid system you have it lined up and you have, you know, just the straight boxes and all around you see, you know, this kind of vibrant situations. So I literally twisted this master plan and tried to bring in those kind of quality of this courtyard situations, of this playfulness of the round shape, the square ones. And um, this is how the master plan looks like in the end. So we just built this building. And if we get enough funds, we're starting in December with this one, which is a school for sustainable construction. This is a school for, for agriculture right now. This would be hostels for boys and girls, and then the teacher accommodation, community hall, library, and so on. And this is how you see me again designing. So first I go to the master plan scale, and then I scale up the models. You know, I go in a different scale, but I'm really designing on, on clay models. And, and then it goes into one-to-one -one scale. This is Katharina Kohlrose, my manager on site. So this is how I really love building. You design it on a small scale and then it just goes, goes to the site and in, in, you design and build with the same material. And this is how the site is growing up. Yeah, less concrete, more earth is something I really believe in. I think we need to build good examples all around the world, in Europe as much as in Africa or Asia, to prove you know, that natural materials are something absolutely precious when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to the health of our planet, and when it comes to the health of our bodies and of our society. Because you know, we need um, just more justice and we need to create work and we need to, to also to work together. And that's a wonderful thing that you can do with this material. And you probably wonder already, you know, how is it possible to scale up, how to bring it into urban context? Well, this is the city of Shibam that was built 500 years ago. If this was built that long ago, we should be able to use these materials and this way of building today again with all the technologies that we have in our hands. So for me, building with natural local materials is really absolutely essential for the future. We have to relearn this again, absolutely. And if we built all you know, our workspaces, our homes, our cities, our villages with local materials, natural materials again, I'm sure that they would not just be more healthy and sustainable, but also more humane and more beautiful. The last project I want to show is an interior of a 1000 year old cathedral. It's, a, it's the, the Cathedral of Worms in Germany. And, you know, the, the, it just had a temporary altar for a long time, but for the 1000 year old anniversary, they wanted to have a more permanent solution, which was difficult because the background is, is from a very famous Moroccan architect, Balthasar Neumann. And what do you put in front of, a, of a, a famous interior? It's very difficult to find an architectural solution for that. And 
there was a competition and in the, the final round, there were two projects. It was ours and then there was an, an altar made out of steel, beautifully designed. That would have been, you know, kind of brought in as a ready-made object into the church. And we had a, an alternative proposal. We said, we're not coming with the ready-made object. We're coming with the tools. We're coming with the materials. And then the, the community comes together to build the altar where they celebrate also, you know, the Holy Communion. And this is what we did. So from the choir, from the community council, from the altar boys and girls, they all came together and started ramming. And it doesn't look like this, but it was quite a hard work. You know, you could do this for a while and then you had to hand it over to, to your colleague. And that had just the same as effect as in the Meta School. You know, when you when you have to pull your talents and, and your strength together, you know, all your energy together, and you're pulling in the same direction, that really bounds people together and that really creates a strong community. And that has been a tradition in the past. You know, we all came together as community to build a school, to build a, a city hall, to build um, a church. And this kind of, you know, pulling in one direction and physically working on site. And then in the end, standing in front of the result and, and being proud and knowing that you're part of it, along with the group that is really building a, a st very strong community spirit. And, this is what I find extremely fascinating with architecture. You can build up a building and at the same time, you can build up a community. So the, the, the process is just as important as the outcome. And we only learn to design the outcome. We only learn to design the buildings, but we also have to have a focus on designing the process because this is giving the power to change the society and to strengthen our team and, and strengthen the community spirit. We also brought in a lot of elements from the historic parts of the town, from the Roman Empire, for example. But then very, very fast, people brought in also personal items, you know, a necklace, an old songbook, postcards, letters that were meaningful to them. The best wine in the region got in. And of course, you know, the children also came and brought some, they wanted to bring in some pink glitter. You see it just in a second. Yeah, the, the priest was not very happy about that one. He was a bit afraid that in the end, you know, the altar would glitter in pink, which wasn't the case, luckily. And then there comes the moment, you know, when the formwork gets removed. And usually that's the most important, you know, moment as an architect, when you finally see the result of your work. But in that moment, you know, it was not that important anymore because, you know, the process was already so good and the community was already so strong that it, it was just half of half of the meaning of, of this, of this um, project. And you see it here, we couldn't let go of our baby. We just, you know, didn't want to part. We wanted to pet it all the time, you know, and touch it. It was really, you know, when all the energy is in that and you work for it, you know, together, that means something. You put a part of yourself into the structure. And this picture for me is, is very symbolic for our society, you know, with all the gold in the background, we are not lacking of, of materiality. We are not lacking of, of, of physical things, but we are lacking of good relationships. That's really something that we are lacking. And we lack meaningful work. We lack for, we have meaning. We long for meaning in our lives. And I think, you know, this is what architecture can also really contribute to. Now, form follows what? So always the question, I think form follows function is really outdated. There are so many functional buildings around. There are so many good looking buildings around. But what we really need are meaningful buildings and real beautiful ones from within beautiful. And what does it mean, beauty? I think, I mean, for me, beauty is a formal expression of love. And if we do things out of love towards the others, towards the planet, we totally naturally make it sustainable. So for me, it would be 
form follows love. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs> yeah. There must be. Sorry, what was the city? The big city, the bigger city? This was Shibam in Yemen. Shibam. Yemen, yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, before your lecture, I was uh, reminding uh, a phrase that Paulo Santos told a few days ago that we are reversing the industrial revolution, you know? And in a way that, that, that that's another way of thinking. We are returning, but that's not really a return. We, we can't return. And uh, you, 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 you showed us so many clues to, to, to that new way of thinking. I'm amazed, uh, congratulations. Thank and, you. And, and the, the, the final work was uh, really amazing. Uh, the, the, the ethical question you, you raise, it's amazing also. Uh, so uh, any questions to, to Hannah? Christina. Linnis first, I have questions. Louder. Não sei se podemos ver os que estão online, os que estão online fora do curso, não. Madalena. Não, não conseguimos ver. First, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, I have been paying attention to some of, uh, of your works before, and it's really a pleasure to, to have the possibility to, to interact with you. Um, I I am very interesting on raw earth construction. I've uh, gathered some books to go more into it. I participated in some workshops, and I'm really convinced that it is really a great solution, uh, even in European uh, context, to to go for 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 tackle some of the climate change uh, problems and also. Uh, social thing, uh, social issues, and way we relate, as you you mentioned. Um, what I'd like to ask you, because uh, maybe in uh, Central Europe, um, governments and legislation are a, a little bit uh, ahead of us. Uh, is what are the ways you you? You see that so that we can make it uh, more mainstream, like make it a normal thing in terms of uh, engineering calculations, in terms of earthquake uh, uh, resistance, and uh, because like people, uh, uh, I think uh, realize and recognize the quality, but uh, there's the, the movement. Movement really needs uh, to to start. Yes. That's true. I mean, basically, you can, of course, um, reinforce rammed earth or earthen structures as you can reinforce concrete. So you can do it with timber, you can do it with concrete and steel. And, and you know, concrete structures without the steel would also not be earthquake or seismic proof. So you have to, you have to add this kind of, like, but it's, it's not difficult to add these kind of ring beams and so on. It's very easy to do and you can of course also do hybrid structures what i think is essential in terms of political issues or framework is a, a carbon tax you know we have we have very low taxes on carbon emissions in those material and we we tax our human energy um, and craftsmanship rather high mm -hmm. and this is an imbalance that is not healthy you know it's like Building with earth in Germany is it's it's more much more expensive than building in concrete, although it is the building material of the poor. So it's not logical at all, you know. And that means that, but this is not the fault of these natural building materials; it's the fault of our economic system. 
but our economic system is not is man-made it's not a force of nature so we can readjust it and we have to do a reformation of it and carbon tax is definitely something that um, is coming i'm very sure of that we can't we can't do without and that will of course um, bring a lot of changes in, in in terms of architecture and i think uh, we have to be prepared. We have to relearn these things. It's also, of course, we need a bit more brains. We need a bit more, you know, also practical understanding of these natural, natural materials. And um, we just have to include it in our education systems. It's really not understandable where you learn of bricks, you learn of concrete, you learn of maybe of timber, but you don't learn of earth, for example, or straw bale and these things, so, and fibers. So we have to, this is something that we have to speak out. We have to say, hey, we want to have this included in the curriculum. And of course, you know, how our, our curriculums are, 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 are created. I think that is also, you know, we, they are supposed to be always, you know, completely independent, but I, I doubt that it's, I mean, it's usually, you know, what is in the architectural magazines, it's kind of the avant-garde. It's what we follow. And the architectural magazines are paid by, not, not just by the people who buy these magazines, but they are paid with advertisement and are paid you know, from certain industries. And of course, there is a strong lobby. And we have, to, we have to speak out. We have to be, we ourselves, we people have to be lobbyists for these natural building materials. And of course, it is in the beginning more difficult. But every movement has started with a handful of people. You know, I mean, democracy started with a handful of freaks in Athens, <laughs> in Greece. Yeah. So yes, and the Berlin Wall, no one thought, you know, it would come down in Germany. And it came down, you know, systems are changing and we can also change our economic system. And we better do it fast <laughs> and by design and not just by, by disaster, you know, because this, yeah. this will come if, if we're not changing. More questions? You made an amazing synthesis of all, all, the, all the issues we studied here in our training course, you know? So I'm sure there, there's a lot of questions about your lecture. Christina. Yes, my, my, uh, hello. Uh, thank uh -huh. you very much for your presentation. I've been following your work with all excitement, so I'm very pleased to be here. My first question is regarding, uh, is, is more regarding our social engagement with the populations. And I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very happy with the fact that you're not only working with different cultures, but the fact that you are sensitive of different environments and cultures and geographies. So my first question is related to that. How long before the design do you go? How do you manage to put together the populations to engage the populations to work with you? So this is the, the type of question. My second question is about technologies because you are in a way uh, testing a lot of things and some of them are not easy to put together so you have to learn making and learning at the same time so some of them are even um, well I mean in a way you are trying to see if some of them even work to put together and those exercises you even try in Europe which is very much about certifications and so on uh, so the other question is how, how do you manage in uh, to, to do all that with different materials and so on. Thank you. Yeah, the first question with the communities, I mean, for Bangladesh, I was feeling at home in Bangladesh. I went and stayed there for a year. It, it was 1997. And then I kept coming back every year to that community. So I felt really, or I still feel at home there. I'm still feeling part of that community. And that helped, of course, a lot, also speaking the language. And this is, of course, not possible in, in, in all the countries where I'm working. But that is also the reason why I'm not working in, you know, in, in too many places. So I'm focusing a bit of, of Af on, on African continent and, you know, the, the Bangladeshi, Asian, Indian kind of context. 
where I feel more more familiar and, and a connection. And of course, it's always very crucial to have good partners that are the bridge to, to the community. And for me, it was like the first time it took me a really long time to dive into a, a, a different culture. But it's a little bit like learning your first foreign language is hard, you know, but then you can, if you have the second and the third, it goes, it goes easier. And the more, the more you work in this context, then you can make the connections. You know, when you know Portuguese, then it's maybe with the Spanish easier and then the French, you know, and it's, and it's, it's a bit like this. So, you know, you get sensitized in a way. And, and I think it, you know, you know what, you know, what are the sen sensitive issues and, and, and it, you're not stumbling in every, in every mistake like you did in the first time. And that helps a lot. So about really having local partners, a good local partner NGO is, is absolutely crucial. And then of course you have to listen to them then also and be open. And I'm always, I'm, I'm not a perfectionist luckily anymore. So I'm leaving space for, for surprises on, on the site. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, this is a very organic process on the site also because I'm not wasting too much time in, you know, super precising the planning before because I know it's anyway changing on the site again. So, you know, I don't want to waste this a huge amount of time before. And then I'm, you know, on the site, I'm either there myself or I have people I trust with and then say, okay, we are open. If things are happening, if things are not working out as we planned it, we are open and we find, we always find a solution and we listen to the people there. And this kind of, non-control freak kind of mode uh, is making things easier in terms of, of cultural sensitiveness and, and cultural adaptation. And with the technologies, yeah, the good thing with the earth is, you know, you can build it in high tech and you can build it in low tech and it's always the same quality and you can even mix high and low tech. And that makes it also applicable anywhere in any context. And you just, you know, find, you know, what's the right scale of technology that you're using. And then, yes, I'm building in Germany, which is a lot of headache. It's easy in Austria. It's even more easier in Switzerland. So there are different regulations in different parts of the world. And there, I think with all the regulations, also question of the Chamber of Architects to really look at all the regulations and ask again this question, you know, who gets the profit? Whom does it make happy? The environment, the people or the lobby, <laughs> or, you know, the building industry? So a lot of rules I have the feeling are also made to, you know, put the profit in, in or channel the profit in certain, in certain streams. And um, I think, you know, it's the safety and the fear is, is a, a big driving force to make money. It's unfortunately the case. And, you know, but maybe, you know, if we go in more and more safety, there is no ultimate safety. There is always a risk. I mean, life itself is risky and, and death is part of life. And if we really want to build sustainable, we also ultimately have to accept decay. This is just a natural cycle. You know, we, can, we cannot plant this out. And of course, we, we can't be in a way risky that, that it's irresponsible. But, you know, there is a limit of, you know, things where we say, okay, we get so super safe, but at the same time, we are consuming so much resources that we are wrecking our planet for the future generations. You know, we have to keep this whenever we do rules and regulations, we have to keep also the environment as part of the table, not, not just people, you know, in the future generations considered to, to be considered as well. And I think we... I mean, in Germany, we have so many rules and regulations and so many are obsolete and not up to date anymore and absolutely not helpful for, for building and natural materials. So we need to look at all these rules and regulations and really also ask the question, who gets the profit? Is it profiting the planet? Is it profiting people? Is it profiting certain industry branches? And, and really just, just see really critical and I think that's a huge task. It's not easy. But for example, I know it in, in Italy, earthen structures is a traditional material and it suddenly got 
um, not it's not allowed to build load bearing structures anymore. Same in Turkey, although it's a very traditional building material there. It's just happening, you know, silently. And because there's no no industry behind, you know, this can be changed. And I think Mexico is the same things. And I, I know it from Simon Veles, who is building in bamboo ex intensively in, 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 in Colombian, in Colombia. He was saying they wanted to forbid bamboo as a as a building material and earth. And he said he could fight for bamboo, but he didn't have the power and, and the energy to fight for mud too. So they, they just forbid it, you know, to build with earth, although it's a super traditional building material for centuries. Yeah. And this is just happening because no one's shouting out, you know, saying, okay, hey, this is not okay. And and then suddenly these rules are existing. And then it's it's difficult to 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 um to to kind of um revise those things, but it's possible. I mean they are man-made and we have to do this. Are you optimistic about uh, the European Bahaus, for example? And the other initiatives to change the, the way we, we think as architects and uh, the, the, the chain of the building industry and so, and so on? Well, um, Earth, for example, was not present at all there. Strangely, the bamboo, <laughs> I don't know why the bamboo, I find bamboo absolutely fascinating, but not necessarily so much in Europe. So I don't know. I also have the feeling there is some lobbyism going on there. But at least, you know, we, we gained some awareness on, on European level, but not enough. I mean, this is, the, you know, the more you, you're involved in that, the more you also have sometimes doubts on, on you know, how, how these, you know, wo how voices are being heard and, and how policies are being made. But we have a voice. I think we just we have a voice. We should not underestimate our own voice and, and yes. to stand up. It's just, you know, I think we have to, to work on a, each and every level. We have to work on the grassroots level. We have to work on the policy level. And and it's a it's a big effort. But I think we only have to we, we it's time to do it. If it's too late, then it's too late. So we have to work on every level. I think, you know, the minute series, I think they do. But of course, it's also the question to whom do they do they listen? I don't I don't really know. You, you, your, your office is in a way a school, I think, because you, you train a lot of people with, with a new way of thinking and to work with the materials and architecture and so on. It, it, the, the, the people, you, you, the, your collaborators and so on, once you, they left your, your office, they, they start their own, their own projects or are there? A lot, methods? yes, a lot. Wow. I'm also trying, you know, to give them, you know, when, when they're, I, I only can take a certain amount of, of projects. So also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm networking for them then also if, if I'm getting asked, you know, and I, I know this, this woman has built already something or has is Spanish speaking. So maybe this project in Ecuador could be something for her. You know, I'm trying to, to connect them then with, with, with potential clients and projects. And, and I really think it's important that, you know, students, when they come out of university, they usually take it for granted. They have to work in someone else's office. I think it's a good moment to start your own your own practice because you know you're not having yet a family you have to feed usually when you come out of university you don't have a car you don't have a big apartment you don't have a mortgage on the house so this is the time to experiment and you're still young you know so i think you know this is really the year one two years where you have to find your own voice and not just sitting in someone else's office and 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 and, and you know learning the old ways to do architecture so Yes, I have people coming in, working here for six months, and then they are leaving. And 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 I'm really encouraging everyone to to stand on their own feet. There's a question in the internet uh, uh, regarding the the, the um, thermal ins insulation of your uh, hearth buildings. Uh, I think you 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 answer uh, a little bit, but can can you uh, explain as how, how do you do it? Yeah, in, in Germany, we have to insulate earthen structures. And of course, I mean, there's a lot of natural fibers that are wonderful, like 
hemp, like sheep wool, like um, wooden fibers and straw, of course. So this, this would be my, my favorite things to do, you know, and it's a good combination, of course, straw and earth is, is wonderful because it's, it preserves the straw. But they, they are headed to the, to the, for example, the, you, you showed us the, the, this prefabricated box. You, 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 you had it in the, in the, in the, in the, um, the earth, the, 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 or, or you, you put it uh, on site? Uh, you can put it on the inside, you can put it on the outside, and you can also put it in the middle. Then it would be like recycled glass, this glass form. There's the sandwich blocks as well, and you can just ram it in. And then if you want to separate it, you know, you just soak it in water, and then this kind of um, recycled glass will swim on top, and the mud will be on the bottom. You just take the, the, the swimming parts, you know, the insulation, and reuse everything again. So it's possible. There's another question in the, uh, regarding the security. Uh, uh, I think you, you, you've also focused that. Uh, but uh, for example, once you have complex buildings, using hertz is not as easy as, uh, for example, uh, um, house, for example. But, but in, a, in a way, you, 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 can, you can add uh, hybrid uh, systems uh, to, to, to the construction to, to add the security and more, more resilience to the structure and so on. Uh, can, can you explain us, for example, uh, how do you manage to, uh, in that in that house you you've shown? Uh, uh, you, you 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 I think you have concrete also, not only hurt. And which one? I mean, in 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 this project in Germany, the the bigger part is is load bearing earth walls, just earth. But and I, I, I saw a pillar, for, for example. A, the ah, that, that, but that was the, the wooden structure, yeah, but that was just a pillar and one wall. <laughs> the rest is I all load-bearing. The rest is all load-bearing in, in, in timber. The slabs were, were also in, 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 in wood, uh, uh, maybe. The floors and the ceilings were also... Uh... That, that is timber and, and then then you have this, uh, what is it called? You have this very thin layer of estrich, what's that? That's kind of, but it's a very thin layer and then it's just the, the mud on top again. I see, okay. But you can also do it yeah. completely with rammed earth floors as well. Okay, Paula? Yes, I have a question to you, Anna. Um, I, I loved very much your presentation. And I found that uh, at the same time that you have um, uh, a speech about uh, construction and uh, uh, you have also a symbolic uh, statement that is the meaning of architecture itself. And uh, there are two examples that I think are very related with this. One is the house for birth, that is a beautiful idea. And uh, it's very, uh, and the other is the altar or, or the, 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 um, the place for therapy that you design and looks like architecture is a kind of skin for the man. I mean, very close to the body. And that's uh, something, it's, it's like um, the architecture uh, is more belo belong more to the people that use it, that's not normally our construction. I mean, especially urban construction. So my question is um, how important is in your, in your lectures and in, in, in teaching this idea of uh, uh, the relation, the symbolic relation of architecture and uh, and our life. I mean, our our uh, our way of living. That's the idea, because this is the most important uh, for me in your speech. I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think the act of building is something that is part of our human DNA. It's like every child is playing to build something, or every child is is building with textiles, with branches, with, you know, it's any, I mean, I don't know anyone who didn't, didn't build something as a child, you know, you come together and you build something and animals built. I mean, everyone is, building. <laughs> it's, it is part of our, it's very much part of our DNA and in our genes, I think. And this is kind of, 
lost. You know, we delegated it completely to experts, to architects, to contractors and, and craftspeople. But I think this, this need and this urge for building a nest is still there. And then what happens, you know, you get your house and everything is ready and then you're running to Ikea or the hardware shops, you know, and then you start, you start bringing in, you know, or, or fulfilling this need for creating your nest. I think this is why this yeah. kind of interior shops are so popular because it's kind of, you know, trying to fulfill this need. And I'm trying in every project, I'm trying to keep a part of the construction to the users that they have the ability to do a wall. For example, you know, in a kindergarten, you could easily do one wall with a mud plaster that you can shape, you know, in a relief or with, you know, in, in, and, and people can touch and can be really, and then at the same time, it would be good for the classroom because of the humidity balancing things, you know, and, and, and then it's also really physical. If you have the element earth, it's not just the building materials, an element, if you have this in your room. So on all these levels, it would work. So I'm always keeping a part of, of the project that the users can do something if they want. Because I think this need is something that we should take serious. It's just, you know, this is how humankind grew up with. And we cannot just delegate that completely to experts. There's another question in the internet uh, and it focuses uh, an issue that, that I find also interesting. Uh, it's the, the way you face uh, the, your design thinking in a way is, is more like an arts and crafts uh, return to, to the tradition to the that the, 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 the architecture is a uh, comprehensive approach to to the to the, the people and the 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 the, 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 the doing things the the, the objects the, the and and you showed us uh, for example this this link between the the your project in, in Bangladesh between the the, the building and the 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 the, the, the how can I say the, the the tissues and the the the, the textiles and so on? So, so it, it, your your approach to is also uh, to to face architecture as a, as a, a comprehensive way of thinking, or or, or you, you you focus only in the in the construction and so on. That's yeah, for me, architecture is really physical as well, and the process is really just as important. So, and I think it's also, I mean, in our parts of the world, we are facing more and more um, psychological problems also, you know, we are so much trapped in, in a virtual world and we don't see the outcome of our energy anymore. We don't create many things anymore, or right? it's all data that we create and, and, and we don't really create things. And I think a lot of satisfaction and also mental health is linked also when you see the results of what you, you know, your energy can create. And I think that would be, that is an issue we have to tackle. And, and I think, you know, of course we can 3D plot also earth houses and we can do a lot of CNC cuts with, with wood. But the satisfaction of creating things is something that I think as a society and as individuals, we need. And we cannot completely mm -hmm. delegate that to machines. So yes, the act of building and the crafting expert, uh, I mean, the, the crafting process is something that I think is deeply fulfilling. And yes, the very heavy work and the no, I mean, the non-pleasant work, it's nice if, if machines are taking this part over, but this, this refinement and, you know, refining of surfaces and, and this, all this fine tuning with the crafts, I think that is, is deeply fulfilling. Yeah, there's another question here. Uh, how would you expect community engagement in the construction processes in the European countries to be as intensive in develop uh, as in, the, in intensive in developed countries where there's still a strong crafts tradition 
as well as in society which is not so stressed with civilization. Uh, yeah, I you know, the, the altar or the birth room, there are examples how it, how it works, you know. It's like, like the birth room that were all people that were managers or, you know, therapists or whatever <laughs> that, that worked on the site. And the nice thing with the earth, it's, it's a, it is a very inclusive material. You can use only your hands, you know, you, it's not so much danger to harm. And you cannot do this kind of participation with every material, but it works. And, and for example, in this large structure in Germany now, we also put in a similar structure like the, the birth room just or the Omegon one just in a, in a different function and in a different design, but similar. So this is something, you know, we're gonna do with the users. Any more questions? I have a question just to how do you finance your projects in in these communities it's is the the governments or it's a local or or it's the community how do you do it I mean like in Bangladesh I knew that they need a school you know because I knew the community so I am very often also the initiator and the crowd funder of this project so and but, you know, of course, this is quite an effort. On the other hand, you know, we invest so much time in competitions. And if we only, you know, I mean, there is easily six, seven competitions that you do, you don't win, you win one. If you take all this time and energy and, you know, to initiate your own project, it's worth it. <laughs> and then, you know, you can fully stand behind this concept and, 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 you're just much more into this thing as if you're, you know, you're just hired as an, as an architect. But I, I'm, I'm always very much also really part of, of the concept and, and is initiating the thing. Like in Ghana, for example, now I'm responsible also for, you know, to organize agricultural training. In, in Bangladesh, I'm responsible for the textiles that are happening in the building. So I'm not just responsible for the vessel, the, the building, but also often for the program that is within. So it's, you know, it's it's just happening. But I think, you know, it, it is a big effort, but it's also deeply fulfilling when you're, when you're really part of, of, of the whole process. And I think, you know, if we do a little bit less investment in, in, in competition and use this time for, for community projects to initiate those, I think that works out. There's a question from an architect, I think, from Belgium. Uh, he's asking, uh, thank you for the lecture. In Belgium, BC Architects uh, is using rain herd as a construction material. Uh, within the urban context uh, of Western Europe, the office emphasizes the, that using rain herd requires a long process of finance resources. However, uh, the office point out the, the potential of using hertz as a construction material for precast blocks. Uh, you, you've shown us a, an experience uh, similar. Uh, if if uh, I, I look back to the example showing as an urban siting and multi stories multi building are built in a different climate that the, than the one in Europe and without the construction security factors in the balance, etc. Does uh, is construction uh, with locally available materials not also bound to the regional regional climate? Oh, that works. That totally works in Europe too. I mean, we have a lot of earth and heritage, for example, in Europe. It's just we have a, a cultural blackout or amnesia when it comes to to earth and structures. But even at the Champs Elysees, they have been. Uh, rent earth houses they were just plastered you so you wouldn't notice from from the outside so it definitely works in our climate and i'm super happy about my colleagues in bc architects in, in belgium or also in paris there is now an, an earthen factory the point is you know the more the land prices go up the more infrastructure we have to put down and the more we, we carve out you know the more Underneath parking, metro line extension, like in Paris now, they expand the new um, 
uh, Grand Paris Express with the metro. So they have a lot of earthen resources where they don't know where to dump this. So instead mm -hmm. of dumping and paying for a landfill, you know, it should come into a factory and then, you know, building blocks are created out of it and then you can staple it. And the height of Paris is definitely possible with earthen structures, you know, these five, six stories. This is something that works in load bearing or of course also in hybrids. And yes, it totally works in our climate. And if, you know, you can also of course add a lime plaster if you want, you know, if you're not sure about it or add a, a, a timber facade if needed, but it works also as a ramped earth uh, visible structure, it does. Let me ask you a thing about that, that uh, urban, urban design in a way that you then uh, regarding the, the resources to the construction and the, the houses and etc. So so you 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 have this this uh, uh, care to 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 guarantee that the, the 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 building materials come from from nearby. No, so you you had to 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 uh, not only to 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 care for the sites where the hurt came, but also the bamboo um, forest that that you 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 you've created there. You 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 have this this engagement, or you 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 the people only use the the, the traditional um, values uh, value chain that that they they are used to that they, they are placed in the site. Uh, so uh, in a way, you 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 have to 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 care about this. It's not in place. Uh, is it true? Yeah. So. That, of course, is the ideal thing that you dig your foundation and you already use the building material from the site. Of course, now, since, you know, or, you know, you, you put it out and then you bring it to a close by regional factory and then it's, you know, processed into building blocks and then brought on the site. That would be the ideal thing that was happening, for example, with the Herzog Dömeron building in Basel, the Ricola Herb Center. Um, the Martin Rauch built or also Darmstadt. There are several structures where it worked like this. The problem is now in Europe that we don't have this network of, of regional earth factories, for example. That has to be something that, that needs to be created. Now, for example, for my, for my project in Germany, that um, we were looking for empty, you know, factory halls where we can process this, this earthen um, blocks we didn't find the space, absolutely not. So I have to bring it from, from Vorarlberg. And of course, this, this is not ideal, but I would very much hope that in future, you know, you have your locally sourced Brussels earth block and your Paris earth blocks. And like in Schlins, it's also in Vorarlberg, it's existing. So you have this regional construction material and with all the excavation that you have, it's plenty available. And of course, in, in Portugal, you also have beautiful soil um, yes. with this beautiful color. So it's, it's there, it's underneath our feet. And all we need is really just courage to use it, the sensitivity to see the value in it, and then the creativity to use it. Any questions, uh, emotions of diffusion? <laughs> I think there's another one here from mm -hmm. Philippe, Monica Philippe. Uh, uh, Philip, Monica, you, you've talked about uh, a point, uh, the feminine way of making architecture, not w women, but doing architecture, but a more feminine approach do, to it. Uh, then can uh, be both performed by women and men. Uh, I, I would venture uh, to say uh, you were talking about an architecture of feelings, of through, of emotions, of diffusion of formless, of uh, flowing, the life generation of body and physical instead of mind, of going with life uh, and nature. Uh, uh, would you like to deepen a little bit about this subject? Yes, it was uh, one of the more amazing parts of your Yeah, I think you know, in architectural education, we very, mu very much focus on, on the rational thinking, on analytical thinking and but we know that I mean designing is always decision making or do we go high do we go flat do we go you know fine do we go massive 
So it's constantly decision making. It's nothing else. And we know that we, I mean, we can take our decisions based on, you know, analytical thinking, or we can base our, in, uh, our, our decisions on, on intuition. And architecture is an extremely complex field, or there's so many things. And the more complex situations are, the more difficult it is to grasp everything just by rationality and, and by analytical thinking. So I think we have to really train our intuition as much as we train our analytical skills and in educa architectural education, basically in, in all sorts of education, we very much focus on the rational part. And, and, and I'm trying in my, my teaching, I'm trying very much to, to also strengthen the, the intuitive pick part because we all feel it, you know, when we design, and we built with, you know, with this large clay models also in, in a team, we feel when it feels right, you know, that it makes, you know, ah, now it's good. We don't have to talk and discuss much about it. You know, there are these situations where, you know, oh, now it's good. It feels right, you know, and, and it feels right for the place. It's, it's the right mass for the place. It's the right height, the right scale. You feel it, you have to test it. And you get this feedback from your gut feeling. And the, the faster you can listen to this gut feeling, the faster you can, you, you realize and you hear your intuition, the, the faster you, you can design and take the decisions. And I'm really, I, I very much try to, you know, I do the analysis in the beginning. I check what are the resources on the site, the potentials of the site. And then I'm trying really to make my mind completely free and just get the, the intuition. And sometimes at best is when my hands are taking over the control and my head is completely gone, you know, and I'm just working out of my gut feeling and get the impulses right from my belly into my fingers, into the clay. And it works like this. And it's a training. You can train your intuition and kind of both sides of the brain equally. And I think that becomes, you know, the most surprising designs, the most humane designs and lively designs. I can't hear you. Yeah. Madalena, uh, uh, só mais uma ou duas perguntas mais. Uh... Sorry. Uh... Uh, well, I, I it's it's two two things. Um, first, um, you mentioned uh, I think that was visible in the author uh, projects, but um, also in 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 the other ones in Bangladesh and in Africa. For me, I um, that is which is um, uh, how do you see Earth as um, uh, an opportunity for so social bridging. And, and I tell you where this comes from. Because um, I, I lived in Africa for two years and I used to hear about the raw earth uh, adobe houses as temporary construction when everyone aimed for um, um, uh, cement bricks construction, uh, which they, they would call it definite uh, final construction or uh, long lasting uh, construction. And I was curious about the, the project you were commissioned about in, in Ghana. If you see that, um, or other in other experiences that make uh, both people more, I mean, of higher income and lower income uh, get together and see, see, see Earth more as a solution for both uh, for both uh, contexts. The other thing is, um, where would you suggest that I uh, look for uh, the more updated uh, knowledge, technical knowledge about? Because I, I my hint is um, traditional construction uh, to, to go for it, which is not uh, wrong for sure, but. <laughs> Uh, you probably are more in, in, in know more about that. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, people always think, you know, those kind of structures are super durable, the cement blocks, for example. I mean, it's, it's a mental thing. It's just, I mean, right now in Bangladesh, they have teared down the 50, 60 year old houses. I mean, they were strong. 
and the tin houses they will last maybe for five six years but it's a it's a mindset and i think it's very important that also in europe we show you know that you can build very good solid beautiful structures out of this material <coughs> modern architecture i think this is really something that we architects have to show and we have to show it also in europe and then you know not just build it in africa and in asia but also really show how it works here too because this is where, where they, they look for solutions. And we just have to build good examples. I think there's no other way, you know, examples that excites, that really touch you emotionally, that make you feel proud. And then I think, you know, that's the only thing how we can convince through really beautiful designs with this kind of materials. And in terms of, of books and, and techniques, I think like um, Refined Earth of Martin Rauch is a very good book with a lot of details. It's Refined Earth. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of technical know-how there. And then Amaco is a good site as well. I think they have a lot in the internet also. And then there are a lot of um, like summer schools and workshops of Base Habitat in Linz, Base Habitat, B-A-S-E. Mm -hmm. And BC Architects is also making workshops in Belgium. And of course, there is this master program in, in Grater, in Grenoble, in France. And also Base Habitat has a master of architecture and development where you also learn about earth and architecture. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much, Anna, for being with us. I think, uh, as I said uh, earlier, that that your 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 lecture was a synthesis about all, all all things that we studied in the in our training course. It was amazing, Add, adding this feeling and this engagement with 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 the, with the profession and the, and the people and. The, inclusion nobody is left behind i think uh, so in a way i think it was a golden key to close our initiative mm -hmm. and we hope to to have you in the next uh, training uh, the next two training courses that uh, will take place uh, next year paula do you want to say something paula, no you... just thank you very much i think we we have uh, a lot of uh, issues that we could uh, um, speak about, but uh, we have other opportunities. I hope. So thank you very to, much. Pleased to meet <laughs> thank you. you. It was and, a pleasure uh, to discuss with you and talk with you. Thank yeah, you. and see you soon. Thank you yes. very much. Muito obrigada. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings to Portugal. <laughs> adeus. Uh, obrigada. Adeus, adeus, adeus. Obrigada. Bom.